final of the British Team Pursuit Championship in Leicester. With four riders each, the teams start on opposite sides of the track and try to catch up their opponents. Tonight's winners are led by a super champ of the biking world, Olympic gold medalist Chris Boardman a man who's grown used to victory. Boardman's been a giant of the track ever since he struck gold at Barcelona in 1992. By winning the toughest race of them all, the individual four kilometer pursuit, he became a sporting hero overnight. This is an athlete who leaves nothing to chance perfecting his grueling schedule with the latest computer technology. For track racing, this is superb form of training. We can measure pedal revs, power output, higher part rate. Um, that's about it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. so is that thing you put around you, is that heart this rate? Is, uh, this transmits uh, the heart rate to, uh, to the rig via this little box here, uh, and also to the, uh, to the watch. Uh, so I can use the watch when I'm out training. Heart rate isn't the most accurate way of uh, measuring how, how hard the body is training, but it's the most accessible to us. Uh, to be able to stab yourself every few seconds and measure the blood lactate would be the most accurate way, but uh, obviously that's not exactly practical. From near Liverpool, Boardman has been a dedicated cyclist since his teens, surviving on sponsorship. Now 24, he wants to cash in on his triumphs and join a professional team on the continent. But first, to prove his worth, he wants one of cycling's biggest prizes, the world one-hour distance record. The main aim of the year was the world hour record, uh, and in cycling terms, that's, that's a big deal. And of all the records, this is, this is the one that is most important. To the general public, an Olympic gold medal is everything. So winning in Barcelona meant a lot on the celebrity side, but not necessarily in the sport of cycling. Boardman will be attacking a record that has stood for eight years. But now he faces an unlikely opponent. North of the border in Ayrshire, an old rival is also taking up the challenge, training alone in the backyard of his house. Graham O'Brien, unknown and unemployed, has had a patchy career in cycling. He's been on the dole for six months, but now he's training hard for a comeback. He's decided to have one more crack at the big time. At 27, O'Brien knows it's now or never. The maverick from air has decided to pit himself against the Olympic champion. He too is going for the world one-hour record. A major influence in that was Chris Borman himself, because Chris had won the Olympics, and it was a surprise to me, and I don't know if it was a surprise to Chris, but uh, the fact that he won that gold medal, and basically I thought, well, blimey, wait a minute, uh, I used to be able to take this guy on. Sometimes beat him, sometimes he would beat me, but I was taking him on. I didn't, re didn't realise that we were both at that level, and that's it, basically, that was a factor in making a difference. Most of the top riders are afraid to tackle the hour record because when you go for the hour record, it is reported throughout the whole world. If you fail, it can get a serious setback to your career. The trouble is, for me, I didn't even have a career. My career was down as kids before it even started. All the odds are stacked against O'Brien, who, unlike his well-equipped rival, has to train alone. O'Brien has only his intuition to go on. What a lot of cyclists are involved in is a culture where they're involved in computer analysis, heart rate monitors, timed exercises. 
But for me, that, that doesn't really work out because I don't have the access to specialist people who know exactly what these things mean. What I've got is a system already that, that I know works. It's basically listening to how my body feels, which is a very complicated machine in itself. But uh, I do use the huge gear on the bike. I've been doing some strength training to cope with this big gear on hills in Scotland, which is basically keeping the bike in a big gear and forcing the pedals round, which is more or less the same as doing weight training, except on the bike. And for me, that, that tends to work. It's not just a question of peaking physically at the right time. Competing at this level requires a very special bike. With no backup team to provide it, Aubry will have to build his own. I've got a friend, Gordon, who has a workshop and a, a bicycle shop. He said to me, use my workshop. And he also said he has old cycle tubing, which I feel free to use. So I thought, that's great, I'll go for it. Bicycle building is something that I've always been involved with. At the time I started cycling, I couldn't really afford the top-notch equipment that some people were riding around on. There was no backup in terms of people offering carbon fibre bikes or whatever else. I had to build this bike, otherwise I wouldn't have a top-class bike. You got some memory pots as well, Gordon, yeah? Same as you do. Oh, I do, yeah. So you can shine up that middle bit. Yeah, when you ride someone else's bike, like Chris Bowman had the Lotus bike last year for the Olympic Games. After the Olympic Games, it was claimed that that bike gave Chris Bowman a 13 second advantage. If that's claimed against my own bike, they're either complimenting me as an engineer or complimenting me as an athlete. Right, Scott, here you go. They can't take everything away from me because I've built my own bike now. Many starts we need to do. Uh, four or five, maybe. Yeah. Just to see what sort of pick up I'm getting on it. Aubry has designed a bike like no other, but theory needs practice. So just see how quickly I can get into a river. With the help of a borrowed car and his brother-in-law, Martin Cole, Aubry tests it out on the local bypass, the closest they can get to the flat track of the velodrome. So, what you can do, just start. Hard starts, and up and up one side, you slow yourself down with the car, and... Okay. Wait till I get in the car. It looks uncomfortable and dangerous. But Aubry swears his new bike will give him extra pedal power because of his unique riding position. The riding position itself is radically different. It's more like a skier's position without the poles. The knees come closer together now, in a more natural position. To construct this attempt at a world-beating superbike, Aubry has plundered key parts from an unlikely source. The, uh, the most difficult part to produce on this bicycle for me was the narrow bracket itself, which in the end, uh, I managed to use an old washing machine. But what I had to do is take the washing machine to, to bits and uh, I discovered that behind the drum, there was these bearings, which whizzed round at something like 1200 revs a minute. And the, the washing machine continued to be useful and I managed to use the side panel uh, of the washing machine for these parts here, which uh, forms a box section, gives a lot of strength to the bicycle. So you had to make that box section? This, is, uh, this tube continues on down, the same as this part, and this is an, an addition to the, that tube, which forms an extra box section for strength. There's a lot of stress in this part of the bicycle, and it, uh, it was ideal. So it's part bicycle, part washing machine? Part bicycle, part washing machine. But unfortunately, I can't pedal at that rate. <laughs> 1,200 revs a minute. 
but can he pedal fast enough for a new one-hour record a week before Boardman's attempt? He certainly can. This unknown amateur rider from Air in Scotland is now smashing the most coveted record of them all. His radical style, his homemade bicycle, the world hour record is going to fall to Graham O'Brien by the end of this lap. There's no doubt about that now. 51.596 kilometers. Francesco Moser's record of eight years ago has gone to a rider on a homemade bicycle. We were a bit disappointed, to say the least, when when we planned this for so long and we'd worked six months for it and uh, all the governing body and everybody else knew that we were going to do it. Uh, and then Graham announced he was going to do it the week before. Uh, and he also really he wanted to do it on Bordeaux, but there wasn't any track space uh, because there was a national championships going on at the same time. But that would have been even worse. And we were a bit disappointed that the governing body got behind it when really they should have said, we're, we're supporting Chris. When we're finished with him, we'll look after you. But uh, I just had to put that out of my mind. And, and get on with my job. Boardman's job has suddenly got much more difficult. To maintain his reputation, he has to beat Obrie's astonishing new record. Well, the figures are indicating after eight kilometers, the Boardman has gone ahead of Obrie's schedule. And look at this now, Chris Borman, the first man ever to go inside 23 minutes, and he is 15 seconds now ahead of Graham O'Brien. Sally Borman knows now she's cheering her husband to the world hour record. This is absolutely impossible for Britain to believe. In six magic days, they have presented us with two world hour record holders, and Borman now is going to become the first man ever to take this record over 52 kilometers. The gun goes all famous names have wanted to take this record. None of them have done that. It's Chris Borman who gets it. Yeah, it's funny hat, isn't it? Everyone remembers the hat. I think we've seen enough now. What? Oh, that was, uh... What? I was talking. Do you know? It's, uh... It was quite amazing, the press, after that. And we were only really prepared for it because of the Olympic Games. The Olympics was big for the public and it was big for PR in this country. But as far as cycling Hold goes, the, the World Hour Record is much, much bigger. The World Hour Record is uh, They're not all blue free. ribbon racing cycling, in four minute mile equivalent. That's it's a technology I've used a lot, but that's the only one that most normal people you like can uh, can understand. Are you gonna talk to your mum? Yes. Go on then. Over there. So you're very different from Graham in the way you go about things. I think Graham and I are very, very different people, but the basic uh, philosophy behind what we do is the same. We don't take things for granted. We don't accept the norm. We all, we're very questioning people who always want to know why. Why have we always done it that way? Why should we do it that way? Uh, how we've decided to, to go about implementing that philosophy is very different. I've gone a more scientific route. I want proven fact. Um, and Graham explores things his own way decides the way he thinks is right and goes that way. I do a similar thing, but I like it proven to me as well. This sort of training is aimed very much at explosive effort, getting everything out in four and a half minutes. So we run uh, at powers well exceeding of the threshold. We can do maybe five, six repetitions of this for two minutes at a time and just try and increase the body's tolerance to lactic acid, which is one of the major limiting factors in this type of race. If we can increase the body's tolerance to lactic acid, we can go faster. Boardman is back at the top. With his experience and his support team, he seems invincible. The next big event in the cycling calendar is the World Championships in Norway. As Olympic champion, Chris Boardman has an automatic place on the British team. But for Graham O'Brien, selection is by no means certain. He still has to qualify, and that won't be easy. Where's your dad going? Is he going to leave his bike again? He's going to leave you, eh? Hey. Hey. Dad'll see you later. Dad's going to his bike again. Hey. Hey. See you later. He's always leaving his bike. Hey. Hey, you're a big boy, you'll go back some time. You'll take him away for a week again. Yeah. <laughs> right. 
Just like Boardman, Aubry is driven on by the hope that he may one day be able to turn professional and make a living out of cycling. During the winter, he was getting a bit fed up with having no money because we were unemployed, we could hardly pay the mortgage. Um, so he really was deciding to try and go and get himself a decent job. But I felt that really he had too much talent to do that. So I didn't mind, well, I wouldn't say I didn't mind being broke, but I was willing to maybe suffer on a little bit, knowing that at the end of the day he was doing something that he wanted to do. At the time, I really didn't think it would happen the way it happened, but it did, and I'm delighted. You know, there were so many people that really didn't think he could do it, and I think that was quite a lot of the drive behind them. Sometimes something can happen, and you can have a catastrophe. He could fall, or he could crash, or whatever. With Graham, you never know, but I know if he's going well, then he'll do his best, and I don't know what his best is, and you're to see, because he's never been at this level. You know, he's never been given the chance. But the big chance won't come unless Aubrey qualifies for the World Championships. And to do that, he must win the individual pursuit here at the National Championships in Leicester. It's an event he's never competed in before. I expect you to be ready to move across and keep the programme rolling. That's my job. Between us, we'll make this job go You'll have a pleasant national championships. If you don't do what I ask you to do, you'll have a very unpleasant national championships. Well, today I've got my, my selector's hat on. Uh, I'm the national coach, as, as you know. Uh, but uh, I'm making our final selections this week of the championships for the, for the world championships which will take place in Norway in three weeks' time. It's make or break for the flying Scot. He must beat the others here if he's to race Boardman in Norway. He gets off to a blistering start and even overtakes one of his opponents, a magnificent win. Aubry and his brother-in-law are delighted, but everyone knows he still faces tough opposition. <laughs> We're down to four riders. All four of them have beaten the minimum acceptable standard of four minutes, 50 seconds. Uh, two of them, uh, Graham O'Brien and Brian Steele, have actually beaten our elite standard of 440. So I would expect that... Um, that in, in, uh, in the final, we're going to see Graham O'Brien and uh, Brian Steele. Uh, the winner will be offered that final place uh, in Norway. The British Championships at Leicester. Graham O'Brien must win today to qualify for the World Championships in Norway. It's do or die. This is the ride for the championship. Graham O'Brien in the home straight and Brian Steele in the back straight. Two innovative bikes, Graham O'Brien's own machine in the home straight and the Lotus machine that won the Olympic gold medal in the back straight. We're ready in the home straight. We're ready in the back straight. Over to you, Mr. Starter. Five, four, three, two, one. Starter! It's a disastrous start, giving his opponent, Brian Steele, an easy opening lead. But O'Brien isn't done for and doggedly chases Steele. By the end of the fourth lap, Aubry is beginning to get back in the race. The gap is down two and a half seconds. Steele is digging deep, but look at Aubry, right down between his elbows, head stretched forward, mouth open. He wants this one. Round of Dramatically, Aubry pulls ahead. Aubry by two seconds. Uh, this is last the lap is a triumphant frenzy. Down the back straight. Round the banking. Congratulations, Graham. Superb series. Superb series. Thanks so much. I hope you'll be joining us now in the World Championship team. I certainly will, yeah. We might need to change the pedals. 
<laughs> well, let's just tighten them up a bit. Yeah. <laughs> At home in Scotland, O'Brie winds down, enjoying the time with wife Anne and their child Ewan. The most important thing in your life is your life itself. That your life should be uh, for living, and your sport is something you do in your life, rather than the other way about. A lot of people that taken over the sport, and eventually it comes full circle and sport ends up being out of their life because it takes too much time. Some things I go out with Anne and you and, and the, the kiddies seat and cycle along, enjoy the, the air, enjoy going along the seafront and uh, just enjoy it. And it takes the stress and strain from the, the whole training thing away. I think the mental relaxation factor is a, a huge influence in uh, sport and performance. Some people, are, they're always tensed up, always thinking about the sport. And by the time they get to the actual event, they're mentally tired, they're, they're drained. I only train about three hours a week, serious training, but I'm on my bike about ten hours a week. The other seven hours are spent winding down, loosening the muscles off, not seriously training, but loosening off, and basically enjoying riding my bicycle. But competition beckons and the pressure mounts. O'Brie's quest to be a world beater has its price. He must soon leave his home in Scotland and his family once again. Newton Ards, Northern Ireland. Tomorrow, O'Brie will race against Chris Boardman in a 25-mile time trial, their last meeting before the World Championships. <laughs> <laughs> Would it give you a psychological edge over Graham if you won it tomorrow towards the world? Um, really, not really, because Graham is one of so many people I've got to be at the World Championships. Uh, and for him, it's his debut at the Worlds, and I know what the other people can do. And so I'm a lot more worried about the people that are there than, than Graham. And that's no slight on him. I think he's, you know, he's got to do as well as he can. But he's one of many people I'm thinking about, so I don't really think of it that way. Now, when it comes to sheer speed on a bicycle, these two men are certainly amongst the best in the world. Olympic gold medalist Chris Boardman and Graham Obrey are here in Northern Ireland for a brace of races in Newton Ards over the weekend. Well, it was Graham who set a new World R record a few weeks ago, only to see it beaten by Boardman, but Graham had a pretty good performance only yesterday. Graham, is there much tension between you two when the media try to build it up, don't they? I think it's essential to have a rival. Sport will be boring if, if you come out and won and won races without any competition. I think Chris feels the same. Uh, we don't like be, being second, neither of us do, but I think having competition is good for the, the, the sport in general. And this will be the bike you use and will be using over the weekend? This is one I'll be using this weekend, but I think Graham's right there. The best races to watch are the worst ones to ride and vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks lads very much indeed. Well the racing begins tomorrow with a, a series of criteriums and then there's a team time trial on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. That should be well worth watching. Radio. And a warm welcome to our sports rundown here on Downtown Radio with me Ken Johnston. Spectators have been pouring into Newton Ards throughout today, anticipating a close clash of titans as these famous rivals Chris Boardman and Graham Obrey race for the honours. Ahead of them, a 25-mile time trial around the jewel of County Down, that's Strangford Lock, towards its imposing cap of Scrabo Hill. It's a big field. Together with some of Ireland's top easy, amateurs, John. juveniles and veterans make up the numbers. Stewart, get in there. Right, let him up. Break early, it's very slippy. Come on, Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy. Two years ago, O'Brien beat Boardman here, but today he's dogged by bad luck. Boardman, the Olympic champion, wins again and sets a new Irish record. Hello. I get beaten. I uh, punctured. And then Martin changed the wheel on that road bike, you know, the training wheels. 
and they cycled on and Martin changed the back wheel, it's a back wheel as well. So Martin changed well out the chain and all that and fixed it and then uh, I cycled on and on and on and then he caught, caught me up. But, and then I, I changed into another bike again. And then I fell off at the turn. <laughs> oh dear. So many cans, I lost it with two minutes. How did you find the course today? Basically, as long as, you, as long as you didn't have to touch the brakes, it was okay. And the police yeah. made that possible. Three hundred times my heat fell off the turn. Do you find that's slippy? Surprising, the turn? no. <laughs> it was very slippy, yeah. Uh, no, it doesn't really surprise me. But uh, you've got to be very careful. We're both using the same tyres, and they're uh, they're really on the limit, those tyres, so you've got to be very, very careful. I didn't put too, too much pressure in today. Like I say, I don't take any chances before the world. But it's uh, excellent preparation. Thank you for time. Well done. Man. Thank you very much. Yes. I'd like to thank everyone. And I'd also like to say it's unfortunate what happened, the, the bad luck that, that Sean and myself, and I know that Chris, do, he doesn't like to win by bad, by someone else's bad luck, and but it's the way it goes. So perhaps if there's another event, we could sort this out once and for all. <laughs> the next event is the World Championships, now just a week away. Hi Dave, it's only Chris. Uh, I need the last Royce bracket to go back into the Corimus spare bike and the tool to put it in some time before I go to the Worlds. And the time trial bike, uh, I think it's still at yours, the one we went to Scott, um, that needs to get to Paul somehow for him to use at the World Championships because it fits him better than his own. Uh, and if possible it needs to have 54, 48 rings on. So you can either get in touch with Paul or direct with me. Uh, when you get in today. Okay, thanks, bye bye. Chris Boardman may be an amateur, but he has a team of professional mechanics and frame builders. But O'Brien does it on his own. The handlebars are going to be off the other bike. It's the World Championships next week, I really need a spare bicycle. So the black bike there's no handlebars on it. So I must build a pair like this for the bike. That's the problem. So I've got to get the same dimensions as this one. Because the saddle and that other bike's in the same place. So I create measurements from the saddle. I'll get exactly the same position for the other bicycle. This is the this is the bike you're using in the world, so is it? This is the one I hope to use, but I need a backup just for emergency. The other bike isn't so good, but uh, if it comes to an emergency then I must use it. Uh, it's better than being left standing with nothing to use. Heimar, Norway, where Obri broke the world one-hour record earlier in the year. Now the venue for the World Championships. From the word go, it's sudden death. Out of a field of 55, only the four fastest will get through with a chance of a medal. With no time for individual practice laps, experience is at a premium. I think with me in the Worlds, I think Chris has got a huge experience advantage over myself at the moment because you know, he's won the Olympics, he's been pursuiting for years and years. I've been trying to make up this gap, but at world level, Chris has so much experience that I don't have. And the trouble with the Worlds is it's one ride. It's not, you can't have a bad ride and then ride yourself back in. Can you see him? His brother-in-law, Martin Cole, is now his manager. Aubry is beginning to build the kind of support team enjoyed by his rival. I think I could be six or first here. I really don't know. No, I mean, it was the risk that I took, and I said it weeks ago, that when we decided to go for the R record so close to the world, that the preparation for one interferes with the other. One is aerobic, it's real threshold work, and this is just peak power. This is about absolute top end power. Uh, so we've done what we could since then but it's a bit of damage control early as opposed to perfect preparation. What is the same bike? Same bike, but now I have the pedals on. Shoes bolted on. Ah. I've saved, dropped my seat. Shoes, by, shoes bolted on? Yeah. Oh. By doing that, I've dropped my seat position down. My seat's dropped 22 millimetres. <laughs> seat and handlebars both dropped. Yeah, yeah. You recall that... Um, the problem he had starting in the final at Leicester when he pulled his foot out. Uh, now we're making sure the foot won't come out. Uh, the, the shoe and the... it's an integral shoe and pedal. You just have to be a little bit more careful getting on and off. 
but um, in, in the pursuit, one man alone on the track, and uh, we'll assist him getting into them. There should be no problem. What about your life in uh, Scotland? Do you have the telephone now? Telephone, yeah. Ah, <laughs> telephone number, yeah. It's 0292. If you look at the rides that he did in the national championships at Leicester, then I would think that Graham O'Brien yeah. is a serious candidate for possibly a top six place, which would be an amazing debut ride in a World Pursuit Championships. I would be disappointed if Chris Boardman didn't win a world title. He must go in as favourite for the individual pursuit, and I would also think that uh, it would be a tragedy if he didn't get a medal. Get to about halfway and you're a second or so down, I'll tell you you're either one down or two Great. down. And you can you can work the rest out for yourself. If you're Great. one up, you're one up. Great. It means you've I've really got to do a ride here that can sustain oh, twice. Yeah. Right, you've got it you've got to do a ride. That can sustain twice. Well don't forget we can analyse the ride, can't we? Right. I suppose I go I actually destroy myself and can't do the same ride later on. If you don't if you don't destroy yourself, you don't do it in the top four or the top eight, do you? The moment of truth. Can Graham Obrey and his bike outpace the best pursuiters in the world? Just nice, just nice, just nice. This time, it's a first-class start. Obrey immediately starts to overhaul his opponent. Shit, shit, shit. Like catch her, Russian. What's he gonna do, Dick? About to 23. Jeez. That's a world breaker. It's a fantastic prospect. Come on, come on, come on. 23, 24, 424. Jeez. He misses the record by half a second, but it's an outstanding ride. Back on your road, Mike, straight away. Outstanding. Absolutely outstanding. It's very good. You understood the call? Very good. You were on it. I must have lost about you, you were on it in a second and a half. I mean, a lap and a half. You were on schedule. Very, very good. Outstanding. <laughs> you must have practiced that a bit, Graham. These shoes make all the difference. Don't tell everyone. They'll all want them. <laughs> Now Boardman has to chase O'Bree's time. It's the bit just prior to the gun going off that's the worst. Once it's started, it's out of your hands. You just do what you do and hope it's enough. And the first couple of laps aren't too much of a problem. Uh, after four laps, it becomes extremely painful. Uh, and I start to wonder whether I've gone out too fast and whether I can carry this on for the full distance. You pace yourself and end up getting to the finish line absolutely spent with maybe 20 yards to go. If you feel an absolutely spent with four laps to go, that could have considerable repercussions for the final time. He's doing all right. He's uh, level with Graham Andre. Down on, he's down on Ermelo, the French guy. Yes, yes. We think is very much a one-ride specialist. 24, 7. So that puts him third fastest. Third to Aubry in the qualifier. Now Boardman knows the Scotsman is a real threat. Graham is just awesome. I just totally give up trying to predict him now. That's it. I'm never. I'm just not going to try and predict him anymore. Because you never thought he would do that. No, no. I thought he'd be around 4:30, and if he really did well, surprise us and get inside 4:30. But 4:24, awesome ride. So you've got a lot him of respect. Now. Yeah, I've got Graham now. Luckily, the battle's not over yet. I think I've got a bit more in the bag. Whether Graham has, I don't know. And I'm not going to guess this time. Has O'Bree got anything left for the head-to-head -head with Boardman? At the World Championships in Norway, the decisive showdown is at hand. Boardman and Aubry face each other in the semi-finals of the individual pursuit, the outsider from air against the Olympic champion. Chris Boardman, he really is the appliance of science, and um, he has a, a full and very developed support team. They're real students uh, of, of pursuiting, 
and uh, this, is, this makes Graham possibly even more fascinating because he comes in on almost on a wing and a prayer and is competing in the same event on the same track in the same championships and uh, he's closed a tremendous gap in his own way. You all right, Graham? You tell him when you're ready, Graham, when you're ready. Well, fate walks in strange ways. The two men that have fought out the world, our record this year, have now come together in the semi-finals of the men's 4,000 metres pursuit. Chris Borman makes his start against Graham Obrey. One up. Come on. With a quarter of the race gone, Boardman is trailing. Has he got the strength to pull back? Come on, give me that. Come on, wind it. And Obrey today has come to this race, his first world championship with a vengeance. He's taken on Chris Boardman, a point of honour here. He's led from the first kilometre and Boardman is still drifting away. Almost a second down now and we could be in for a surprise. He's going to win. They're in the last kilometer. They're in the last kilometer. Come on, Graham! Two up! Oh, jeez. Four laps to go. Two seconds up. Shit, he's gonna do that. I can't believe this. I'm not good Come on, Graham! Two up! Bell for the final lap, and the man in the downhill skiers position, Graham O'Brien. It's not a question now if he'll beat Chris Borman, it's a question of whether he'll take the world record as well. You've got to produce a record, it seems, to beat Chris Borman, and look at that. Four minutes, 22.668, 2.3 seconds beating a Borman. And now Graham O'Brien goes to the final where he's going to meet the Frenchman, Philippe Hermano. But for Chris Borman, surely that time is good enough for the bronze medal. He won't be happy with that. <laughs> good lad. Come on, you're all right. You pick him up, OK. Hard luck, Chris. Aubrey, the man Boardman wasn't worried about, has beaten him hands down. And it's a new world record. <laughs> In three months, Abri has come from nowhere to the top of his sport, trouncing the Olympic champion. He and his homemade bike, now called Old Faithful, are just one race away from the world title. <laughs> Amazing day for Graham O'Brien for British Cycling, and uh, thankfully we've managed to salvage the bronze medal as well with Chris Boardman. So two medals guaranteed. That's not too bad. So which one's for him tomorrow? Oh well, we got to, this close. He's going to go for the gold now. Well, world record holder. There's only one medal. But I'll do. <coughs> well, I came on to show some continuity for potential bosses. And uh, I've done that, so it's the bottom line, but I can live with that quite happily. When you get a kick in by three seconds, there's, uh, there's no lot you can do about that. Do you think you've had three seconds? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Two and a half, whatever. But it's and it's a world record. What can you do? What can you do? <coughs> Come back next year, that's what you can do. See what happens. See you later. Oh, 
At the team's hotel, Boardman offers a helping hand to the man who beat him. Graham's bike seems to have stayed together till now. It's, uh, it's only got to get him through one more race. I think he'll, uh, I think he'll manage that. His hat isn't the best, and since I'm not using mine, uh, I've said he can use mine if he wants to. And I think he's going to take me up on that. So at least something of mine's going to win a world championship, or at least, at least I hope so. O'Brie, the hat, and the homemade bike get off to a brilliant start in the final. This is unbelievable. The two fastest men in the world over 4,000 metres, and Ermino is now two seconds behind Graham O'Brie. Are there any more surprises in this man from Scotland? Ermino wouldn't like to think so. He's got him in sight. He's nearly got him in sight. He's going to catch him. I've just seen the fastest pursuit in the history of the sport. Graham O'Brie sets the world record of 420.894, and he takes three seconds away from Philippe Ermino, and that is unthinkable. The crowd here in Norway salute the real champion of the world. The first time he's been at the world champion, steady on, Graham. There's no room for a mistake now. <laughs> I didn't think Graham would do as well as he did. But if he did well, he'd get in the top eight. The man just doesn't know what he's capable of, and probably still doesn't. Um, I think going into it that way was probably uh, of great benefit. If you're like it's such a whirlwind, you don't realise what it is that you're doing. Therefore, you don't suffer with the other people that have spent years and years clawing their way to the top, and they, they know what defeat is, and they know what they realise the scale of the thing they're trying to do. And generally, everyone the performance isn't top notch because they they bottle. Uh, and Graham just came straight in and did it, and uh, he probably did it the right way. I came with and got the, the minimum that I, I really wanted here. I showed continuity for the professional teams. So I was, I was content with the result, but it's difficult for me. I was disappointed, and to be around it is hard. I'm very happy for Graham. I know what he's... He's feeling, you know, it's his day, and uh, I wouldn't take that jersey off for, for a week or so. Back home in Scotland, Graham O'Brien finds he's a celebrity whose opinions count in the cycling world. Yeah, what I'm doing just now is. I'm preparing my book, which is a book about basically preparation and training for the aspiring athlete. It's basically for people who work during the day or are at school during the day and don't have the time to prepare at the same level as a, a professional athlete. So this is basically me preparing my book, ready to be hopefully published at the moment. Shaken by the huge margin of O'Brien's victory, Chris Boardman returns to the hard grind of training. And he's got mixed feelings about turning professional. As far as I can see, I can either stand still or go backwards uh, if I stay as an amateur or even stay in Britain. So although the, the thought of going to a continental pro team doesn't actually appeal to me, mainly because I find it very, very scary, it's such a huge jump. I've taken all the, uh, the slow steps forward and now I've got to the point where I've either got to stay where I am or take a huge leap onto the continent with you Greg Lamonds and Sean Kelly's 
and races such as the Tour de France. But to do that, Chris Boardman will have to leave behind the home life that keeps him going at difficult times like these. I think uh, family is very important for, for support, somebody to come back at the end of the day and, and share your problems with. Sometimes I don't be, you know, at some points when things get difficult, you think, oh, it would be a lot easier to have done all this when, you know, if you were single. But when I think about it in, in detail, I would probably have never done what I've done without Sally. Hi, Excuse me, yeah. is my head bleeding? Let me see. No, I'm not sure why. Should it, it be? What? Should it be? No, by accident, to hurt herself with this bit of stone. Tell you what, why don't you see if you can write Edward? I can. Go on then, Edward. Living in Hoylake is, is very important to me. It's not a very special place, Hoylake, but it is home for me. The beach is there for the kids. It's nice in the summer. I am lucky in that it's now possible to commute. It is quick for me to get from Paris to, to Manchester as it is to get from Paris to Brussels. So I'm actually going, you know, going to try and commute. That's something that's important to me for sanity, if nothing else. No, I don't think it is either. No, it's the next. The, letter, the first letter of the next name, Boardman. Is that yes, right? That's what I mean. Yeah, so it says Ed B, doesn't it? Ed B. No, Edward. Edward Borden. Within a fortnight of his defeat in Norway, Boardman realised his ambition and is racing for Gann, one of Europe's top professional teams. After winning four of his first five races, he's invited to compete in the Grand Prix des Nations, the last major event in the cycling season. But here, he faces an unexpected challenge. I have turned professional. It's gone from being a hobby and a sport to being a living. This is the start of a three-week tour of Europe. So I wouldn't see my wife or child for three weeks. And this is the life that the pro has. You've got to sacrifice a bit in terms of family life. I think in terms of money, it's a very short-lived career. You maybe have five, six years earning money. And then if you haven't accumulated enough to actually invest in something else, then you're back to the door again. But even as a professional, Aubry is still doing things his way, in contrast to the more conventional approach of his arch rival Chris Boardman. Chris has joined a professional team which means that he's committed to so many races in the year. I have uh, been a bit wary about joining a professional team because I have to be certain that I'm not going to run myself into the ground. Chris Borbin may be more dedicated than I am. Cycling is his total life. I think Chris has always got that advantage. But when going gets really, really tough, in terms of there's a race tomorrow and there's a race the next day and the next day, I think the wearing down process mentally, Chris has got a, a bit more strength in terms of the durability over the period than what I, ha I have. Today, Boardman comes fourth. Aubry finishes well down the field. But the racing isn't over. Next season, they will renew their rivalry.